actually got started 35 years ago. Um, it was started while we were in high school. We actually, when the shuttle was first thought of, it was actually a two-vehicle program, the space shuttle and then a space tug. The shuttle would take things to low orbit, and then the tug would go to where, um, to the higher orbits where things need, where they needed to go. And the shuttle always referred to these two vehicles, the orbiter and the tug. And then in NASA and Congress and their infinite wisdom only funded the shuttle, and they never built the upper stage, which is why the shuttle goes to where nobody needs to go. It's one of the big problems with it. And we decided we were gonna build the first commercial shuttle, and we bid on a NASA contract to, for the study for the space tug. And we actually got through several layers of the down select um, and were one of the final candidates, and they discovered we were all 17 and couldn't even legally sign a contract. Um, so we got promptly booted out, <laughs> and we just kept going. And we've been at it ever since. So why balloons? Well, um, it originally transitioned, we were very traditional aerospace. You know, you put on the suit, you try to raise the money. Um, and then, you know, and we were successful at that, we had a couple rounds of that. And then after Challenger, uh, you know, we actually lost all our funding. Everyone lost all their funding. And we couldn't face putting the suit on again and we're, you know, going back, the whole fundraising thing. So we decided, what can we do out of pocket to get to space? And then we were always interested in the work of Dr. James Van Allen, University of Iowa. You know, people forget that before Sputnik, Van Allen went to space about 16 times. He didn't go to orbit, so nobody really paid attention. But yeah, he was actually putting his instruments up into space, not from a government program, but out of pocket from a university's professor. Uh, and he did it with raccoons. He was buying surplus sounding rockets, surplus weather balloons, tying one on to the other. And you know, only about one in seven would actually make it up there. But it was so cheap, he ended up running his own space program there. I thought, you know, if he could do that in the late 50s, what can we do now? And that actually tied back to our original concept that we wanted to eventually get to, but kind of brought it into the forefront, and that was the airship to orbit. If you can fly a balloon almost to space, you know, if you can get it right up to the edge, what would it take to cross that line? And that's when we really started working on our original project more in earnest instead of something we wanted to, to do. And that was, you know, in the early 80s um, that we kind of transitioned to that. So, uh, how, how long did it take before you, you, you um, had a balloon that reached a, a high enough altitude that you could collect good data, or, or just be uh, proud that you reached that altitude? Oh, in the early 90s, we started doing the serious flights um, that were, you know, reaching the 100,000 foot level. Um, Took a, lo a lot of stumbles, a lot of not getting there. Um, you know, a lot of trial and error, because this was before GPS, before companies would sell you weather balloons, so you had to make your own, um, before electronics were really small. Um, so there, there was a lot of figuring it out. So at what point then did um, you realize that you could have, bring along small payloads onto the different balloons that you, that you were using? Well, um, we'd always flown student payloads. You know, everyone would know a professor or know some student, you know, uh, wanting to do a study, and we'd always flown other people's stuff on our stuff, you know, right from the very beginning. But getting someone else's stuff into your stuff right when you need to launch and fly is horribly complicated. You know, the whole integration, even of simple things, you know. And then uh, we know Bob Twiggs, the inventor of the um, CubeSat. And and the standardization is a great thing. You know, if everyone comes in the same, it's very easy to integrate. And he's kind of the father of that whole CubeSat standard. But for us, that was too big. Um, so that's what came up the PongSat, you know, the, the ping pong ball satellite, where everything goes in a ping pong ball. And then instead of taking, you know, two weeks of an engineer's time to integrate one student's experiment into your system, you can integrate a hundred experiments in five seconds. You open the lid, you pour the ping pong balls in, you close the lid, integration done. <laughs> um, and 
On our first mission for PongSats, maybe six years ago, we started the, the PongSats. Uh, we flew 13, and it was a run to 100,000 feet for high school students. And it's just been exploding ever since. You know, we don't charge for them. Um, they're just ride-alongs. And they cut their ping pong ball in half, put their experiment inside, and send them, to, send them to us. We always thought we'd have to advertise, start telling people, making, um, letting people know about it. But we've had such a flood of them. Um, this, we have started doing an annual thousand pong sat mission. You know, we always did ride-alongs uh, on missions that we're already doing. But we decided to do a dedicated flight series. So every year we do four vehicles um, in the spring that is just pong sats, where we can do a lot of them. And we did one last year, our dedicated mission, where we did about almost 900 pong sats on board. And this year, before we had announced you know, that we're going to have space available for 1,000, we had 1,600 sign up. And and that was before we even announced it or told anybody about it. Just the word of mouth running through. Oh, we think they're coming up on one. <laughs> um, so we're now going to be doing 2,000 PongSat missions a year. We're going to try to do another one in the fall and maybe bump that up to a 2,000. You know, people wonder if there's actual interest in space. Or some people, you know, NASA fights and fights to try to get payloads. We heard the, one of the deputy directors yesterday talking about they're going to provide some of the payloads because there's just not enough people interested in flying payloads out there. I don't think he's talking to the right people. <laughs> you know? Definitely not. Um, well, what are the, some of the most uh, unique Pong sats that you guys have gotten? What are some of the most uh, technologically advanced doing good science and, and scientific experiments? And, well, yeah, just what are the most unique and what are some of the coolest ones that you've seen? Well, a lot of them are, are the unexpected ones. You know, the littler kids, because we do kindergartners doing space experiments. We have a 14-year-old that's been to space, or the edge of space at 100,000 feet, four times now. You know, they're high-altitude engineers, you know, that work on the big research programs that spend their whole career to get two or three missions in. And this junior high girl has four under her belt to the same altitude, getting the same little payload space at the... Um, the engineer is spending his lifetime career going into. Um, but we fly everything. We make no judgments on the payload. You know, sometimes we get gummy bears from the uh, kindergartners. And it's more of an inspiration thing. Their eyes get this big. They see the video, black sky, curve of the earth, and their thing in the video, and they're looking at it in their hand. Um, all the way to that, to the very sophisticated. Uh, it's amazing what they get into a ping pong ball. Sometimes a full satellite system, redundant pair of computers, a data logger. We had one from Sweden that had 17 sensors on board. They were measuring everything. It was vibration, pressure, light sensitivity, radi cosmic radiation. I don't remember all the things that it did. G-loading all the way up, logged all this data at a high data rate, all inside their ping pong ball. So I put his name down so I can hire him later. <laughs> he was 14. We thought, okay, his dad's working on it. You know, his dad, something like that. And then we, when we sent it back, we had a chance to talk to his dad. And nope, nope, that was his son. His son was kind of bewildering dad with what he can do. It's one truism we found with PongSats that if it's plant seeds and marshmallows, it's a university professor. If it's got two computers, five sensors, a data logger, telemetry system, junior high. <laughs> Uh, we've had some cancer research where they've taken cells, put them on tape and a sampling tape, rolled them to get exposure, um, vacuum exposure, cause, you know, radiation exposure on the very inexpensively. Looking at it as an alternative to some of the other um, ways of getting that data. Um, a lot of microbiology. We don't allow live creatures in PongSats. Um, you know, it can't, it can't just be a cricket killing program. <laughs> However, it's a university doing some actual experiments with you know, live cells uh, in a container. Um, that's OK. Uh, we're just across the board. And the unexpected. You know, a lot of times, we'll get whole classrooms instead of individuals. And we had one, and it was from the San Francisco area, you know, only about an hour's drive from us. So I gave, went back and gave a presentation on it when I returned them. And there was one that was just a blank ping pong ball. 
you know, with the ID number written on it. So all I have to do is write the ID in the number because they all start to look the same after a while. Um, and I made a special point just to talk to that student because I had this vision of this kid sitting in the back of the class not wanting to do it. Yeah, I just turned in a blank ping pong ball. Didn't even cut it in half. Um, and I mentioned that to the teacher after the talk. I said, oh, you don't have to worry about him. He did his entire materials analysis of the ping pong ball prior to flight. He did surface roughness, compression, bounce height, a little pierce to, I mean, it was, he did about 20 different materials tests prior to the flight on the ping pong ball and then was going to repeat them after the flight to look at the change in the material. And I kind of thought that was the slacker in the back. <laughs> it turned out to be one of the more sophisticated ones I'd ever seen. Um, so, so we don't ever judge the experiment, even things we think are completely silly, because you never, never know. You know, you'll get that one in a hundred or one in a thousand that just uh, makes it all worthwhile. <laughs>